Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening whenever you may be listening, and welcome to a very special episode of Latitude, the 42 North podcast. This week, the podcast is produced in collaboration with the University of Buffalo School of Management Alumni Association. I'm Nate Benson, Director of Media at 42 North, and I'm joined this week with my co-host Darren Treadway, faculty expert at the UB Center of Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness. Chloe is a group of researchers, scholars, and experts who work to create more effective leaders and organizations. Chloe offers programs, training, speakers, and conferences to help people lead at all levels at their organization and in their community. This week on the podcast, we're thrilled to have Dr. Norma Nowak, founder of Empire Genomics. Dr. Nowak is also the executive director of the New York State Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics and Life Sciences at the University at Buffalo. She's an acclaimed researcher and leader in the world of life sciences. But you know what? I think it's better that she tells her story. So let's jump into this week's episode of the Latitude Podcast. Uh, Dr. Nowak, thank you so much for joining Darren and I on this podcast today. How are you? I'm doing great today, Nate. It would be better if it was 70 degrees and sunny, but I'll it, take it. <laughs> <laughs> it was on Monday. So, I mean, you know, we got our day. I think, you know, now we're just being selfish, right? That was spring. That, that was, was it. That was that spring was it, is right? over. Yeah. We're now into fall. Everything will be fine. <laughs> um, you know, Dr. Nowak, I, there's, I don't think anyone in this community who doesn't know you, but giving to the listeners the benefit of the doubt for those who don't know you uh give us the quick pitch of who you are and uh what you do for western new york right so i'm currently the executive director for the new york state center of excellence in bioinformatics and life sciences i'm also a professor in the Jacobs school of medicine and biomedical sciences and i'm the founder and chief scientific officer for empire genomics llc and a 43 North board member. I'm a 43 North board <laughs> member, yes. Uh, so you've got plenty of free time on your hands to just, you know, have leisure. Among and other boards, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so you're quite involved in the, in the Western New York sci- life sciences community and startup community, huh? Absolutely. I mean, the life sciences has been my life. But as you go through your life, you begin to learn that you integrate that into the community. And that means actually reaching back and enabling students to also look at you and say, you know, I can do that too. That can, that can be something that can enrich my life and I can chase that dream and actually realize it. And that goes all the way back to our Buffalo Public School students here in the city. You know, looking at the tail of the tape, so to speak, you've co-offered uh, 145 research articles, obtained more than $70 million in research funding, uh, founded Empire uh, Genomics, uh, role model for women entrepreneurs in Western New York uh, and around the world. Was this always a dream of yours? Was life sciences and being kind of uh, a superstar, so to speak, locally uh, in the life sciences community, was that something you've always wanted to do or did you, you know, want to be a gardener? You're, like, where, where, how did you get to life sciences? <laughs> I do like to garden, but <laughs> and I'm always thinking about the microbes in the soil. And of all course that. you are. But no, actually, so I, um, I had a very inspirational grandmother. So my grandparents were... My grandfather actually came over from Poland. He was an immigrant. My grandmother was a child of immigrant parents who had a farm out in what's now called Swarmsville. Mm -hmm. But my grandmother never was able to go to college, go beyond that secondary school education. And when I was a child, she basically would sit there with books from the library and her own books, and we would walk through those books. And a lot of them were talking about what different diseases were and how the body worked. And she died when I was... I think six or seven years old from cancer. So she was someone that I spent a lot of time with. And, you know, whether it be looking, reading books about the human body, talking about disease, we did jigsaw puzzles together, we did all of that. And it was really, you know, formed that foundation for, well, you know, this is, the body is a really cool organism. Mm -hmm. And when she passed away from cancer, that was a devastating blow to me as a child because we were so close. So, you know, I ended up having this sparklet by my grandmother all those years ago, and it just kept growing as I went through school. So whether it be, you know, her influence, and then when I went to, um, I was a, so I'm a graduate of Buffalo Public Schools. There were teachers along the way who I can still close my eyes and see as if they were, it was yesterday, and name them, and think about the things that they did in those classrooms that were so inspirational to me, and so taking that spark and really building a bonfire. I went on to high school. I went to Old Mount St. Joe's, which was a girls' Catholic high school, and I have to say that the Sisters of St. Joseph were really women before their time, so Mm -hmm. they were very much into science and education, and Sister B. Manzella was the principal there when I was there, 
and uh, you know very I saw be not that long ago she's still very much involved in tutoring kids in the city and you know I have always looked at her as again another role model and then I went on to Canisius College and had that great experience there where you, you again you meet Jesuits who they, you know they are thinkers they, mm -hmm. they make you question sure, question sure. things and he had a great experience there from um, at the time, uh, Dr. Joe Tomasulo was a huge influence on me. And I often speak about how when I was a freshman, he convinced me to take senior level courses because he needed someone to teach the labs. <laughs> and I kept thinking, you're out of your mind. I am, you know, I'm a right, freshman. Right. And it ended up being one of the best things that I had done because it, number one, built confidence, but it also further cemented what I wanted to do in life. It just seems like you've had this, um, you know, att attraction to uh, inspirational role models, you know, your entire life, almost like you were destined to yourself be a role model. I have to say, so, you know, my father and mother never got to go to college. You know, my father was a Buffalo police officer for a time and did border patrol, but he always worked in government service. And my mom later did real estate, but they never had the same benefit that they gave me to go to, you know, and get a college yeah. education and then you actually take it beyond a college education. And what was so lucky was, you know, I honestly believe, no, I, despite what happened later on in my life, I have led a life which was day after day inspired by different people who were part of it, whether they be family members or people in the community who took the time because they saw this little girl who had this passion and help me grow that passion and follow that dream. Along, uh, along those lines, I guess, um, when we talk about females in STEM fields, we still see a challenge um, in representation, in opportunity. Um, I guess I would ask a little bit or hear a little bit about maybe what you think might be some systemic reasons for that. Are there societal reasons that, that young ladies are not encouraged into these fields? And uh, perhaps in your role or or what your organization is doing, uh, in what ways are we trying to uh, encourage, uh, encourage young ladies in those fields now? So Darren, STEM wasn't even an acronym <laughs> when I was going to school, right? <laughs> wasn't even a thing. Wasn't even a thing. But I, I don't, you know, I have to say that I never felt that, you know, for me it was always that inborn passion to, to follow that path. I think a lot of girls today may think that STEM, the STEM field is challenging because of the mathematics that's involved. But I think if you believe in yourself and really what you want to do, and if that's the path, you want to become an engineer, a biomedical engineer, so that you can, again, have that engineering interface with you know, sciences, which then, again, help a, pa a patient population. There's no reason why you can't do it. It's just finding the right mentors and the right people who become, as I always call it, you know, I had a wonderful village around me for my entire life. And no one gets to a great place in life without that village. And I think it's just helping children find those people in the community that basically pay it forward with them. It is an amazing story you tell uh, about that village that, that helped you uh, achieve your, your dreams, really, right? Yeah. You, you talk a little bit about, um, quite a bit about the, the influence of, of the sisters, uh, influence of uh, Canisius. Um, does that kind of... Uh, um, experience with uh, spiritual individuals inform you at all about your leadership or the direction of, of your research or ideas? Right. Well, you know, I think what happens is the sisters basically, as very strong women, ingrained in the girls that went through Mount St. Joe's, the ability to believe you can do anything you want to do. You can be a man, you can be a woman, but women can do anything that they set their sights on. It's going to take a lot of hard work and determination, and yes, you're probably going to have to overcome some, you know, barriers, but you figure out you know, do you go around them? Do you climb over them? Do you push them over? <laughs> you, but you take one of those approaches, and you do There's it. There's another question about which one of those you've done the most. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just oh, we'll, get to that. we'll get to that. But the bottom line is, it's really having that confidence in yourself that you can do this, and that's where that village becomes so important. And yes, you know, so I went from Canisius, which was a very small school, to getting my PhD at the University of Buffalo, which is a very different experience. But I have to say, at the same time had great, you know, again, encountered great mentors there. And really that, you know, that gift of education to me is the greatest thing we can give a child in this country. And every child, no matter where you're born, to whom you're born, deserves to have that, that roadmap laid up and, and the ability. We're all leaders in this community. 
we owe it to those children in our community to make sure that they have those same opportunities. You know, you mentioned early on in the earlier question regarding, you know, your grandmother and kind of getting involved with, with science and, and, and reading and, and, and whatnot. Um, what was it, though, just about science in particular, kind of when you're in your college years that was so enticing, especially, you know, getting into the field of genomics, which is a hyper niche uh, of, of science itself? So we think in part, uh, you know, I have to say so when I was doing my graduate work, I met a doctor at um, the UB Medical School who taught a course in basically hematopathology and I was totally fascinated by what happens when blood cells develop. And I can remember him sitting there helping us, you know, define what those blood cells were by looking at them under a microscope. So in the old days, how did you define a disease? It was by like what a pathologist would see when they looked down that microscope. Well, today, we have technologies which allow us to not only look at the cells, but then to look at the DNA within the cells and look at how their DNA then gets read out and then the impact on health. So if there's a mistake, you end up with disease. And sometimes, you know, that's really what happens with cancer. So there's a, if you think of DNA as a, you know, series of letters, and those letters form words, and the words form sentences. If one of the words is misspelled, then you have what's called a mutation. Mm -hmm. And being able to take it from that visual and really understand then what happens at the deepest sense within that cell, to me, was just fascinating. And then if you compound that with the fact that, so I went to college, I met my, my husband at Canisius College, so it was a great love story. And then when we were 36 years old, he was diagnosed with a type of cancer that we were told, you know what, if you're going to get cancer, this is the one to get. And he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And at the time, the great hockey player, Mario Lemieux, was diagnosed with the exact same stage and grade. And I remember saying to Tom, oh, don't worry, we've got this beat. You know, I'm, I'm at Roswell Park. We know all these great people. We'll get through this. And to this day... I still think about saying that because he passed away two years later during a bone marrow transplant. And I have two boys who are, you know, have turned into wonderful young men, despite having me as their mother, but wonderful young men. But I do remember, you know, the younger one in one of our little, he and I are a lot of like, a lot of like in that, I don't know, I've often said to him, you will never beat me when it comes to stubbornness, so don't even try. <laughs> but, you know, getting into something, when I yeah. remember him looking at me saying, if you're so smart, why couldn't you help my daddy? And mm. that, talk about, you know, having something just go at you. Yeah. So, you know, here I was at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute with, you know, it was one of the top cancer centers in the country, and we couldn't help the one person that I needed to help. Yeah. And that was really, you know, in part, the inspiration for Empire Genomics and the work that I was doing in the Human Genome Project. It all just kind of came together. I mean, I was part of, like, the, one of the greatest, greatest achievements in science, and it was all really serendipity and, again, meeting the right people. So when I was, you know, I did my research at Roswell Park, meeting the people there that, you know, I met people like Ming Chu, you know, who developed PSA. He was part of my, you know, my graduate degree. Mm -hmm. I then went, met, went on to meet Tom Shows, who did, you know, trained me in human genetics. I mean, a leader in the human genome organization. And again, it was just those people along the way who encourage you, who believe in you. And at no point in time did I ever think, I can't do this. Did we ever, like, back when we started sequencing the human genome, there was not the technology out there to actually achieve that goal, but we, you know, it was built through a huge collaboration of people, not only within this country, but internationally, that worked together. Not against one another, like we did in the old days, right. when you know, scientists worked in their little lab and they're competing against you know, mm -hmm. Professor mm -hmm. X out in some other country. Right, right. We worked together. And that is how great things get accomplished, no matter who you are or where you are. Big problems get solved by people collaborating and putting their minds together. And again, not thinking about the me, but thinking about the we. As a uh, fairly new parent myself, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. You know, just when you know my five-year-old has a little tantrum and tells me like, "Daddy, I don't love you," like that in itself is heartbreaking. So I, that must have had such a profound, you know, c cementation in your brain. You know, when when your son said that, you know, regarding your husband, oh, it's like a it must knife have a, in my heart. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but on the flip side of it profound impact and a motivator, right? To, to do the work that you're doing out at Empire Genomics. Absolutely. 
So, you know, the idea is to actually be able to use that information within DNA to better take people and what's called stratify them. So be able to figure out which patients will best respond to which treatments. Mm -hmm. And that is really the goal because I kept thinking, well, how can you and Mario Lemieux have the exact same disease with all the same, you know, predictive markers that the pathologists look at and say, you're, you know, you should be in the 90% of people that are going to go on to be fine. Mm -hmm. And he ended up being in the 10%. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's all, <clears throat> as I've said to people, statistics, all that matters is what happens to you. You know, I, I always kind of have this very simple outlook on um, health, and I'm, I'm certainly not the model of, of a physical fitness and or health, but, you know, I always look at, you know, everybody's health really is unique and different, and you know, especially with the work you're doing where you are seeing things at the molecular level, um, you see that firsthand, I imagine, right? Oh, absolutely. I think we're all born with certain risks in our genome. We're also born with certain, you know, benefits in our genome. And it's figuring out how to manage the risk and really maximize the benefits. So, you know, I think about think about people who, you know, smoke every day. Like I had a grandmother who lived in... We all had that grandmother. Punxsutawney yeah. who smoked, you know, unfiltered cigarettes. Yep. And she lived in, you know... Until 99, early, yeah. Early, well, early 80s. Yeah. But, you know, never had cancer, died of emphysema. And then you think about people who have never smoked a cigarette yet are diagnosed with lung cancer when they're, you know, in their 40s. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's your information is encoded in that DNA, and it's how do we look at that information. And from the time you're a child, can we leverage that information to ensure you to have the healthiest life possible? You're dealing with these incredibly complex problems that affect every single person. There's not a person, uh, as you were talking I think of my grandmother, uh, I think of my mom just recently, and, you know, I couldn't talk for a little bit there. So, so um, and then you talked about that these big prime problems require collaboration Absolutely. and teamwork. I want to ask you, and I don't have a, I don't want to constrain you with a question, but could you talk a little bit about how, the, uh, how you choose collaborators or, or are people drawn to the project? Um, in other words, uh, do you choose certain people who are part of that team, not just based on expertise, but on, on perhaps um, the way you guys uh, interact or the style? Or is it that these, these big names or these big ideas of these big thinkers come to the problem and it's that expertise that makes you work together? Well, I think that's part of it. But I think at the same time, when you have a passion for solving a problem, and whether that be a big problem in science or thinking about how you conquered a big problem in science to conquering a problem even within our society. And I often look at the work that I you know, did as part of that human genome program and how we all did work together. You set aside your own personal goals to really, okay, make this thing happen, make this genome become evident to the rest of the world. I mean, what really kills me is that what took us 15 years, I can now do overnight at the Center of Excellence. Right. But we're not gonna talk about that right now, <laughs> but. I think the experience really showed me as a scientist, as just a human being, that you know, when the right group of people get together, amazing things can happen. And none of it's easy, it all takes hard work, and sometimes you have to work with some other folks who perhaps aren't as interested, but can you, can you make them understand why what you're chasing is so important? And at the end of the day, if they just take a little time, It'll make their lives better and the lives of you know, their children and the world around them better. I'm and some people, Darren, are never going to because they're just not about, they, all they care about is the me. They don't care about right. the we. So it's finding the people that you know, are willing to say, you know what, look at where I am, how did I get here, and I'm gonna make sure that I can inspire and continue to solve big problems by bringing the right people in the room. It is amazing. you know. The, the folks who you've been in contact with and worked with and what you've accomplished, you know. I don't um, think it's such a big deal, honestly. Well, I know you don't. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sitting here going, as, as somebody who does a little bit of research themselves, I'm, I'm sitting here going, that's pretty cool. Like, you know, um, and I think it's, it's, it's that next point uh, I'd like to talk about in, in terms of the interface uh, between what we do as academics in these pretty, pretty buildings and um, one's ability to... Uh, navigate that interface between academic research and, and its quality and its importance and how do we get the the business leaders and the industry leaders to understand that you know because most faculty members are you know not as dynamic as us but you know they, they like to sit in their office and and uh, uh, you know do their work 
Well, that's okay, right? Yeah. So, it, you know, you're not going to be able to take someone who really believes they're, you know, as you said, they're sitting in their office. But if I look at the younger generation, I think there is a much greater interest in pursuing, you know, taking that entrepreneurial path. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, the professor who basically, you know, makes a discovery and discloses it, somebody can still pick up that disclosure and run with it. So that's still a good thing. And sometimes, you know, you can't force things on people. But I think when I look at the people that I interact with, the students, they, you know, it's funny because they're very interested in, you know, do you want to go work for someone or do you want to be the someone, mm -hmm. right? And t kids today actually believe that they can do it. Yes. And we're providing an environment through, you know, what I do at the Center of Excellence, through business and entrepreneur partnerships, which is an office, you know, at the university, where, again, cre how do we create that culture? How do we create that mindset? From the time a student walks in the door at UB, they should be exposed to all, to these types of opportunities, to programs, and again, being able to participate. So you have an idea, let's help you look at that idea. Is there a market out there for the idea? Nobody, when I was in school, that wasn't part of it, right? So even when it came to creating my company, um, I remember Marnie Levine saying to me, well, you're gonna have to write a business plan and, and do a pitch, and I was like, business plan? I can write a grant, <laughs> I can write a business plan. But it, it got yeah. to be where you begin to learn that, you know, okay, if I didn't have that skill set, then Marnie helped me find people who could work with me and do that. So it's, again, figuring out how do you bring those people together. And at the university, what we're trying to do is, again, bring those types of folks into the university so that even though a lot of people don't think that that's part of a university's goals, in today's world, those public-private partnerships are very much a part of a university's goals. Yeah, just in the, you know, I don't know, 15 years I've been in the field myself, that public-private partnership has totally changed. Uh, the demands Absolutely. on faculty, the demands on even doctoral students has totally changed to bring in grants, to bring in partnerships um, that'll advance not just their career, but the whole university and the field. And it opens up opportunities for them yeah. that for just weren't there. And the institutions that capitalized on that 15 years ago, you know, Pittsburgh with Carnegie Mellon, you know, Penn State, I mean, those those areas are uh, way ahead of other areas because they figured that out you know, 15, 20 years ago. And they are now the kind of staples in you know, entrepreneurship and private uh, public partnerships. If I can cycle back to just uh, when you said about today's students and how they say they, they want to be the change, they want to be the, the difference. Um, I think that's we bag a lot on millennials <laughs> like we the, you know the societal we i think that is a interesting way to look at it this this capacity that they've been told yeah everything you say is important and put it in a tweet you know but that's giving them a whole different way of managing their career i would think it sounds like right a, a way of saying yeah i got something and it matters and i'm going to find a way to share it and um i think that's a really interesting insight uh, about taking these folks who we think are sometimes self-absorbed and yeah in their lives and, and saying, no, they, they really can make the change if they're given the opportunity. Well, if you just look at, again, and you know, I don't know where you stand on all the guns rights, but you look at what those students at Parkland were able to mm -hmm. do. I've never been more proud to be an, a parent you know, here in this country than to watch those students say, you know what, we're not just gonna sit here and be told that nothing can happen. We're going to drive change and we're going to vote and we are going to be a voice Forbes just named them the second or third most important leader yeah. in the world, that, that Stoneman class. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Like a bunch of 15, 16 year old kids saying, you know what, we're not gonna take it anymore. And I, my whole life, and I'm not that young, people have been fighting that battle and they're making a difference. They're making a difference, but it very much harkened me back to the days when, so I grew up during the 60s, yeah. you know, and peace, love, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it was really, you know, it was the Vietnam time, War. It was time, civil yeah. rights. You know, who do I remember? I remember John Kennedy talking about the value of education and the, you know, the responsibility of citizens to take care of one another. And if someone needed to be carried, we carried them. Mm -hmm. I remember Martin Luther King standing up for, you know, every child should be able to go to a school and get an education. There not, should not be a difference between a black child and a white child. And I remember Bobby Kennedy continuing that fight and then you know, watching him during that whole presidential election and run-up and being devastated when he was taken down by an assassin's bullet. And that, I think, in addition to the fact that you know, I grew up in a family that you know, my uncle 
was a congressman here for many years, really, you know, we all looked at where we came from. My parents, you know, spent some of their time living in Black Rock. Uncle Henry, you know, played basketball. He ended up, he did go to college. But my dad, you know, didn't have that chance. He was five years older and, you know, Hank was the younger one. But, you know, having those two men as role models for my sons after my husband passed away, it was huge. But it's also, you know, it's that, that belief. And again, I don't know if it's because we grew up, no one ever told us we couldn't do something. And I think today, the millennials, I mean, I am pathetic with an iPhone. <laughs> what my sons can do on those phones, I mean. Without even looking, they're just like, okay, mommy, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but when you think about how kids today have technology so, you know, mastered by the time they're, I think, seven. <laughs> but the bottom line is that, that does enable them, that empowers them. Back in the day, what, what did we have? We had black and white television, mm -hmm. right? And that, that sat on the floor because there was three so stations. Yeah, right, with three, with three stations. stations, and there was radio, but the yeah. ability to get the word out. The, you know, children today know how to get the word out, and they know how that they, they are empowered by their technology. Well, it's, it's one of those things. It's the do-it-yourself mentality because they've grown up with the uh, technology available to, if I don't get the answer I'm looking for, whether right or wrong, I'm going to go out and seek it on, on the Internet and try to research it and, and, and find those myself. You know, you mentioned how the millennials, you know, they have that mentality of, of, you know, not of being their own boss and not, you know, kind of being told what to do by a generation uh, ahead of them. On the flip side of that, though, and, and I'm sure you experienced this as a leader in life sciences, we're living in this era where truth in science is being questioned. You know, and, and people coming out and not believing science and not believing in the methods of science. How difficult is that to handle on, on the on the leadership level and, you know, from a business perspective where people are questioning the integrity of science? Okay, Nate, so now you're going to get me really angry. I <laughs> <laughs> so the pursuit of science really is the pursuit of truth. Right. And above all, that's what we should be about. Not spin, not, you know what's going on today out there in the world mm -hmm. and actually teaching children that it's okay to lie and that's you know to me one of the biggest crimes that's going on in this country right now as scientists we always seek the truth the epa and what's going on there i mean i'm not going to even go into it because right. i'll go on one of my rants <laughs> but the bottom line is it is important to make children realize that knowledge is power and you deserve to have that knowledge and you deserve to again know what you know What's really going on in this world? And how do, how do things work? That's part of it. But to have you know, someone tell you that, you know, the whole fake news thing. Well, kids today, they know how to figure out what's fake news. Mm -hmm. There are certain other people in this country that don't know how to figure that out. But I won't go into the reason for that. <laughs> Bottom line is, I think we have a, a youth that's now empowered and knows that they can get the message out and knows that they their votes count. And you know, whether it be you know, like some like as I said, the collaborations that we develop in science that take that science forward, or again changing other things that are going on in our country. We can do that because we as a group believe in our mission. Do we need more scientists in uh, in government? I would love to have more scientists in government. Yes. I've I'll often said. <laughs> <laughs> it's a loaded question. Loaded yes. question. <laughs> I know. It's, and it's one of those things where, you know, I often tease my colleague, Amy Schmidt, and I keep saying to her, I'm going to run for office someday. And she's like, let's do it. <laughs> and so, but the bottom line is I look at a country that, you know, what did we learn from the 60s? Have we not learned anything? Did someone lose that message along the way? You know, I truly think that it's time to take a really hard look at what went on in that past election and how what went down and figure out again how to go back to where we do care about people, whether, you know, if someone is fortunate to have had, you know, the experience of getting a great education and has a great job, you have the same responsibility to take care of someone who doesn't have that opportunity. No child asked to be born in this world. And as an American citizen, as a human being, I look around this community and I think about the children here and how can we enable those children to have the same kind of life that I've had and that my children have had. Well, I don't think of a I have a better question way. every time you look at me <laughs> when yeah, yeah. she says something yeah. and I'm supposed to, yeah. I'm over here crying. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I, I'm I, expecting her to just announce she's running right I know, now. I'm, I'm like, just like waiting for it. I'm the politics guy. I can answer <laughs> if you'd like. The, um, I guess... When, when you talk about your story, mm -hmm. um, you're the granddaughter of immigrants. 
-hmm. you're a first generation college student um, you have a, a, a family history in, in uh, agriculture. Um, a lot of that, I think a, a lot of folks listening to this can, um, it resonates with them. It's something that we are in Western New York. Uh, even when you talk about your shared stubbornness uh, with your son, um, we might call that resilience. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, to, yeah, to be more. Belt resilience, yeah. yeah. Are there any parts of that, uh, your upbringing or being from Western New York, that have really benefited you as, as as you've gone through this journey and uh if so do you see uh, on, a, on a larger scale uh, benefits of the people of this area uh, in terms of the next generation uh, moving forward well i think that you know if you think about just the community that i grew up in buffalo really is the city of good neighbors we do take care of one another when someone you know is down we help them and I think that's something that sometimes gets forgotten in larger urban settings. And when I look at just, like, whoever thought that this, you know, this little kid from North Buffalo who went to Buffalo Public Schools would end up being part of, like, the largest, you know, scientific achievement, you know, in my lifetime, who, you know, I still think about it and go, how'd that happen? <laughs> but then you look at the people that were a part of my life. You look at this, you know, the teachers, you look at just the, the family mentors, you look at the friends who were mentors, you know, I can go, I can just name them, women and men alike. But I have to say, you know, through, through it all, I never doubted that I couldn't do something because there was a Joe Thomas Sulu or a Sister B or a Marnie Levine who would be there for me, right? And, you know, or my grandmother, who in those very early days just piqued my curiosity. At, well, well, if you could figure out how to stop this, then this person wouldn't get this disease. How do you do that? I mean, just questioning. And always asking questions in pursuit of knowledge, trying to figure out, you know, what, what are the answers? So you can say, you know, people want to question science. They want, you know, they, they question the, the pursuit of science, which is the pursuit of truth and figuring out how the world around us works. But at the end of the day, all of us are going to have health problems. Right? And if you look at the world, the climate change, oh, there's no climate change. Well, really, really. <laughs> I think it's, you know, there's a purpose perhaps for certain people to want to keep other folks ignorant. And I think that to me is a very destructive force. And if we don't raise up our voices and say, no, that's not how it is, then we all should just just go back and sit in a chair and let let it you know be a spectator because the world around us is going to change in a way that none of us are going to be happy with you know as we wrap up this episode um what's your advice uh to students who might be listening and uh, want to get into you know stem related field science girls in particular um you know what's your last note for them so I would say, you know, no matter who you are or what path, if you think about STEM-related fields, so, you know, people, some people have just a huge proclivity for mathematics, right? So engineering, pharmaceutical companies often will need people who are great at what we call bioinformatics and computational biology. All, you know, you need mathematics for a background. Chemistry, all of those fields, there's nothing different about them than other fields which were perhaps more traditional. But at the same time, it just may not be your thing, right? So STEM, I think we think about STEM in that it builds biotechnology, it builds certain industries. But if you have a company, not only do you need those science experts, but you also need people who are creative because if you've got a great product, no one's gonna care about it or buy it if you don't have a team of people that can market it for you, that can sell it for you, that can do the pitch for you. So it isn't just about the STEM piece of it, it's about how do you then take that idea that came out of you know, a STEM education and actually make it something that impacts in the world in a positive way. And that comes back to, if you can think of a company, it's a collaboration. It's a team of people working together to achieve a mission. And everything in life comes back down to that, working together. And being able to carry a shared vision forward and not letting anything stop you. And I think for girls today, as my grandmother taught me all those years ago, girl, boy, all that matters is you. You figure out what you want to do. And sometimes along the way, there are detours. Don't 
be afraid to take the detours because sometimes they end up giving you the best story of all. Don't be afraid of failure. You know, I was told, why did you start this company? Because, you know, 19 out of 20 of them fail. I was like, well, yeah, but I could be the one. You know, believe in what you're doing. And if you do fail, you're going to learn from it. I mean, there was a science experiment that I did years ago, and the end result, I remember sitting there thinking that this experiment didn't work. And then when I looked at it closer, I realized, oh, my God, it really worked, and it gave me one of the biggest papers that you know, I've ever published. But at the end of my life, I don't want my story to be about papers and grants and money that I bring in. I want it to be about the people who I've interacted with and who I've helped take to the next place in their lives. And to me, Nate, that's, that's what we should all be focused on. For all that we have, we should be reaching back and helping others around us. And that's really the message. So you, can, you pursue your dreams, you, you take that path, but always remember, along the way, there are a lot of people that helped you, and it's your responsibility to then carry that on. Well, Dr. Nowak, I think I can speak for Darren. I can certainly speak for myself. This is a truly inspirational conversation. Thank you so much for joining us this week on the uh, Latitude Podcast, and uh, we'll check in with you down the road. I can't wait. You guys are a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Nowak for joining Darren and I on the podcast this week. Do you want to be a better leader? Visit mgt.buffalo.edu slash CLOE, that's Chloe, to learn more about upcoming programs. And a few house cleaning items on my end, the 42 North competition is underway, and we want your startup to apply for its piece of the $5 million in awards that we have this year. Head on over to 43north.org and apply, and if you email me that you're interested in applying, I can make sure that you get a promo code to waive the $100 entry fee. That's right. Email podcast at 43north.org and tell me that you're interested in applying in this year's competition, and I'll get you a promo code waiving the entry fee. Everybody likes to save money, right? So, you know, what are you waiting for? And head on over to iTunes and leave our podcast a five-star review. The more five-star reviews we have, the higher our ranking is in iTunes, and that means more people will hear this podcast. You can also subscribe to this podcast on YouTube, and you can find that at youtube.com slash 43north, and that's all spelled out. No numbers. The other one was already taken, folks. Sorry. Thank you for listening. Share the podcast. Tell a friend. We want the world to hear the Buffalo story. Thanks again to Dr. Nowak and my co-host Darren Treadway. For the UB School of Management Alumni Association and 43 North, I'm Nate Benson, and we'll see you at the next one.